my name is Dan Lowenstein, and I'm the director of the UCLA Center for the Liberal Arts and Free Institutions, uh, which is sponsoring uh, this evening's event. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, and many, most of you have heard this already, so I'll try to be brief, but it, the, the, um, we're celebrating uh, this year, uh, and particularly this month, the, uh, what I think is a momentous event in the history of the world, uh, particularly Western culture, but even beyond that, and that is the publication of a book, and the book is uh, known as the first folio uh, edition of Shakespeare's plays, and the reason uh, it is so significant is that uh, uh, Shakespeare died in 1616, and at that time only slightly more than half of his plays had been published at all, and uh, although some of those editions were fairly good, uh, some of them are not, so that we have good versions of really only a, a relatively small portion of Shakespeare's output, uh, and um, what happened was that some of his friends and, and former associates uh, got the idea that uh, his plays were so wonderful and it would be a shame to have them lost to posterity, and they decided to put together as good an edition as they possibly could uh, um, uh, with all of his plays. And so they published the first folio, and uh, if, if it were not for that, we wouldn't have uh, uh, any edition at all of, say, Macbeth or The Tempest or many other great plays. Uh, we would not have really good editions at all of Othello, for example, which uh, uh, we'll be talking about. Um, well, actually, Othello, is, the other edition is not too bad, but some of the plays we wouldn't have uh, good editions of at all. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and the reason I think it's so important to the history of the world is that Shakespeare's uh, work has, has just had an, an incalculable effect on the way we think about human beings and the human situation and the way things work in the world. And there's just no telling uh, what kinds of lives we would be living if, if this book had not been published. So uh, I was expecting coming into this year that uh, uh, everybody and his brother would be uh, doing events uh, commemorating the first folio. And to the contrary, uh, I, I don't know about you, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there has been nothing, but I've seen almost nothing uh, in the uh, popular press uh, about this. Um, so uh, I'm glad that we're out there at least uh, waving our little flag. Uh, and uh, so this, we've, I've called this term, in terms of a class of events, uh, mostly Shakespeare. And the reason for the word mostly is that we did have a presentation of a play last Monday night, some of you saw it, uh, uh, a play by Oscar Wilde, wonderful play called The Importance of Being Earnest, and some of you saw that and probably agree with me that that was really a lot of fun. Um, but uh, everything else we're doing this fall uh, is related to Shakespeare, and uh, so tonight uh, is part of that. Uh, just uh, in, in case you're not familiar with how Clap Clapry operates with these events, um, we, uh, we typically will have a lecture on Thursday night, as we're doing tonight, and uh, the per where we're a little unusual is the person who gives the lecture sticks around and the following uh, uh, Saturday morning leads a seminar discussion of some reading that the person has selected. In this case, uh, with uh, Cindy Clegg, uh, the, um, uh, we're going to be reading a play and talking about a play by Shakespeare, namely Othello. And uh, there are some spaces available in that, so if you'd like to uh, um, uh, participate in that seminar, just send me an email uh, uh, and I'll be glad to sign you up. It's Saturday morning and all you have to do is read or reread a fellow and uh, be ready to talk about it. And those seminars uh, are, are really very enjoyable and they're informative and uh, I think the people who come to them really enjoy them. And we have a pizza lunch after them, uh, which you're welcome to stay for. So that's what's coming up we uh, this weekend. Uh, and the last of our Shakespeare events, the last of our events this fall, will be in two weeks. Uh, the uh, November 30th, uh, which is um, to, uh, the week, one week, it's a Thursday, one week after Thanksgiving Day, uh, Dan
Daniel Hannon uh, will be giving a lecture, and uh, if I can remember his title, I think is um, something like Shakespeare, like the gods, or something like that. Uh, uh, do you have a title, Adele? Um, uh, you have it. Making of our reality. Yeah. Shakespeare and the how like how like a god. Uh, how Shakespeare uh, shaped our reality. Yeah, and so uh, I, I so judging from that title, which is the only thing I know about the lecture he's going to give, uh, uh, he's probably going to be talking about what I mentioned, which is uh, it sounds like he's going to be talking about the effect uh, uh, of Shakespeare on our understanding of uh, the nature of the world. Um, he's interesting. Uh, our, our speaker tonight is a, uh, uh, a, a university professor, a college professor, and uh, 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 but she's the only one. This term, uh, our, our previous speaker, this term was an actor, and uh, uh, Daniel Hannon is a politician, uh, but he's uh, he's from Britain. Uh, he's actually a member of the House of Lords, and I forget his title, but he's got a high position in the House of Lords, and. Uh, uh, what I like about that is that he's part of a tradition which I sort of envy uh, the British for, and that is uh, they've had, a, a, going way back, they've had a series of statesmen or politicians who uh, uh, have been, in addition to their political activity, uh, quite distinguished um, literary figures and, and writers uh, about <coughs> literature, history, and related kinds of subjects. Goes all the way back to Israeli and Gladstone, who were the uh, leaders, respectively, of the Tory or conservative and liberal parties uh, in England in the 19th century, in the mid 19th century. And uh, it includes people like Winston Churchill, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, uh, the only, as I mentioned, the only full length um, biography of Churchill that I've ever read is by. Uh, Roy Jenkins, who was a uh, cabinet member, an, important, an influential cabinet member in the Labor Party uh, at the time that he wrote that book or published that book. So uh, Hannon is in that tradition. Uh, he's not going to talk about his politics, uh, which would be kind of quite controversial. We try to avoid that kind of controversy here when we can. Uh, but he's going to be talking about Shakespeare, and I, I think he's in that tradition. And he's also, uh, I, I, I met him once before he was well known at all. I just met him at a seminar kind of thing, and uh, he, he's very, very smart and witty and uh, energetic, and I, I think you're going to really like him. So uh, that's coming up, uh, and his seminar is going to be on Henry V, and I particularly uh, like that, to have that discussion led by somebody who's got some serious uh, government experience. So uh, uh, you can also sign up for that by sending me an email. You don't need to sign up for the lectures, but if you want the seminars, which are limited in size. Uh, then please uh, write to me and, and I'll, I'll enroll you for that. So that's uh, the preview of coming attractions. If you're not on the, I think most of you are, but if you're not on the Claffey distribution list and would like to be, I left a, <coughs> excuse me, a sign up sheet uh, in the back uh, corner there. And uh, uh, please, if you put your name there and email, do it legibly. Uh, um, I got somebody signed the thing on um, Monday, and it's somebody named Melissa. If any of you know a person named Melissa who'd like to hear about clapping, the email address is utterly uh, uh, incomprehensible to me. And uh, she, she did not leave her last name either, so uh, uh, poor Melissa uh, might well be here tonight if, uh, if only she had written uh, more legibly. So if you sign up, uh, please do so. And there's also a Colin put a check mark if you're a UCLA student, uh, and the only reason for that is that if you are and you sign up for that, uh, the Claffey Student Club, which is led by uh, our president this year, Rarish Fota, who's sitting there, uh, 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 they have events uh, that are for students, and uh, so if you if you are a student, uh, we'll send you information about those as well. So. Uh, <clears throat> So that's background, and now for the reason you're here, uh, <clears throat> to, is to hear from uh, Cynthia Susan Clegg, uh, distinguished professor of English literature at Pepperdine. Uh, she uh, uh, specializes in the um, uh, 
the Renaissance in England, that period, and she uh, has a PhD from UCLA, <coughs> and uh, uh, she, um, uh, she her, her specialties uh, include just the history of that period, Shakespeare, uh, and also the history of the book as an object. She probably knows a lot about the first folio if you'd like to ask her anything about it. And, uh, and particularly, uh, and this is more related to what she's gonna talk about tonight, uh, censorship and propaganda in uh, early modern England. I, I don't. I, uh, I don't think they talked about propaganda in those days, but they yeah. probably yeah. had it. Yeah. Oh, did they? Did yeah. they use the word? Okay, yeah. uh, I've been corrected already. Uh, uh, that's pretty fast, but it usually happens uh, <laughs> sooner or later in the night. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, it's just a, a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce to you uh, Cynthia Susan Blake. Thank you very much. You don't want to get in, into anything very controversial. And when I wrote this paper... Of certain on, types of controversy. Well, there, no, I've, got, I've, I've yeah. got lots of... Okay. <laughs> well, so I, I'm, I'm going to open this, and I have to open it with a disclaimer, is that when I wrote this paper, and one of the plays I'm going to be talking about is Merchant of Venice, um, this was before the, the Hamas and bombing and what's going on in Israel. Um, you know, it, it, in some ways, I got a statistic that the... the number of incidents of anti-Semitic publications on one of the websites was 900% greater. And, you know, and, as, and I'm going to frame this because I'm really interested in the censorship. And, you know, sometimes I would really like to get rid of the internet and get rid of all of these possibilities where people can say terrible things without any kind of conscience. Okay, um, I should ask too, I've got, can you hear me or would the mic be better? Um, okay, because I, yeah, thank you. Okay. If you're having trouble, please, there, there are a few seats in the front, so uh, uh, feel free to move up. Okay. Um, and then my other disclaimer is that I'm sure that there are people here who probably know the plays that, that I'm talking about better than I do. Um, and there are some of you who probably don't know them at all. So I've tried to strike a middle ground. <laughs> I will do a little bit of plot summary just in case you're not familiar. Um, and the, my fellow Shakespeareans just have to forgive me. Okay, so I'm, and I will be reading this. In his recent New York Times review of Farrah Karim Cooper's The Great White Bard, How to Love Shakespeare While Talking About Race, the respected black Shakespearean actor, John Douglas Thompson, considers Karim Cooper's view that Shakespeare played a central role in shaping and defining racism in Renaissance England. He asks whether he has, as a black actor who has had a chance to play many of the plum Shakespearean roles, had been looking at the work through rose-colored glasses. He acknowledges that he had long known there was racism in Shakespeare, but had been unsure of its extent until recently, when the issue, he says, has come to the forefront. The question, he says, is top of mind in drama schools and theaters, with Shakespeare's relevance at stake. He knows this, he says, because I have been brought to campuses to talk about it. Uh, while Thompson's review provides compelling insights into both Kareem Cooper's book and his own experiences playing Shakespeare, ideas to which I will return, it identifies a useful focus for thinking about Shakespeare. And this is, I'm, not, I'm gonna use the word contemporary relevance, but I'm not entirely talking about relevance to us, I'm talking about in his own time. And what I'm proposing is that he did some very interesting things dramatically to get away with things that, that other people might not have gotten away with. The American cultural imagination has had an abiding relationship with Shakespeare's plays. They were performed in major cities' earliest legitimate theaters, and itinerant players took them to the frontier towns. According to Anderson Cooper, in the 1840s, Shakespeare belonged to the common people, for whom theaters were one of the few <laughs> refuges for public gatherings, and cheap tickets were considered a public right. So much so that when Manhattan's, Manhattan's Astor Opera House sold expensive tickets for a British actor's performance of Macbeth, handbills appeared around New York City summoning working men to descend on the English aristocratic <laughs> opera house. And a protest ensued. 10,000 to 15,000 came in and rioted. Now I find that just an astonishing thought. They were just mad about those expensive tickets. Um, 
More recent, more recent history, children in elementary and middle schools memorize scenes, Romeo and Juliet, balcony scene, Mark Antony's speech at the um, Friends, Romans, and Countrymen at Caesar's funeral, Hamlet's To Be or Not To Be. Older students read entire plays, and until recently, advanced placement English classes across the country had a shared experience each year of studying one of the major plays, and until, uh, excuse me, for the AP exam. It is then, I think, unsurprising that Shakespeare's relevance should come into question at a time when a consensus about a shared cultural imagination is disintegrating. Questioning the relevance of Shakespeare's drama, however, is taking some very unusual forms. There is the ad hominem objection that insists that anything written in indiscernibly difficult and outdated language <laughs> is by a privileged dead white man from a misogynist, racist, colonialist, enslaving nation has no cultural relevance for us now. Others object that Shakespeare's plays are simply dated, a view that appears in the Washington Post editorial by a teacher who would remove Shakespeare from the curriculum because there is a world of really exciting literature out there that better speaks to the needs of my very ethnically diverse and wonderfully curious modern day students. I do not believe that a long dead British guy is the only writer who can teach my students about the human condition. While the objection here is essentially historic, there are others who simply find Shakespeare's treatment of gender, race, ethnic difference extremely offensive. While some efforts to reject Shakespeare are cultural, others derive from official authority, censorship as we conventionally think of it. The Florida State Legislature has recently passed laws to shield children from sexual content in the school curriculum. In response to this, Hillsborough County's school district redesigned the curriculum guides to restrict students to reading only excerpts from Shakespeare's plays. Oh. The school district's rationale for this is that several Shakespeare's plays use suggestive puns and innuendo, which they do, and Romeo and Juliet even implies that its protagonists have premarital sex. While I concede that puns and innuendo do exist, and a lot of times students don't get them unless you really explain them, um, <laughs> the air about Romeo and Juliet does not bode well for excerpting Shakespeare. Briar Lawrence marries the young lovers, and in the scene when Juliet learns of Romeo's exile, before he comes to her chamber. She refers to Romeo as husband and expresses the fear that she will lose her chastity to death, not to her husband. Um, she's married. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I, I don't know how they exert this. Um, censoring Shakespeare plays on moral grounds is, of course, not new. Thomas Bowdler and his sister, Henrietta Maria, famously published The Family Shakespeare in 1807, in which his advertisement claims nothing is added to the original text but those words and expressions omitted, which cannot with propriety be read aloud in a family. Uh, and you know, and I, think, I find this really interesting because um, Shakespeare was writing for audiences that had women, and in fact he was writing, his four plays were performed before the queen, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and there were a lot of um, apprentices, who start, many of them started their apprenticeship at um, 12, so there were children in the audience. In Shakespeare's time, since both the theater and the printed word were subject to official censorship, looking more closely at the controls can help us understand how brilliantly Shakespeare's plays engaged the thorny issues of his era. The theater censorship was in the hand of the Master of the Revels, whose office came within the purview of the Lord Chamberlain, Chamberlain a member of the royal household. The Master of the Revels oversaw entertainments presented before the monarch and the court to assure that they were in sufficient number of good quality and appropriate to the monarch's interests. Elizabeth I was particularly fond of theater, and at the time, the public theater was just emerging. The playing companies, including Shakespeare's Lord Chamberlain's men, were often invited to perform at court. The master of the rebels' mark of approval on a written text, playbook of a play, performed at court soon extended to the books of plays performed in the public theaters. A parallel system of approval was in place for print, but rather than being under court jurisdiction, it was overseen by the London Company of Stationers, the trade guild that enjoyed a monopoly on printing and selling books. Anyone who printed or sold books had to be a member of the company or have a select special permission from the monarch. Uh, stationers had to register the first edition of any book they printed with the master and warden of the company, which extended to the station of the right to his copy. So it was a an er, an er, very early version of copyright. Um, theoretically, a stationer could not enter a title that had not been 
per perused by a member of the clergy, appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Bishop of London, but the company officers did not always require official approval. Books of a religious or political nature and translations of foreign books almost always were entered with authority. Practical books, dictionaries, books on husbandry, cooking, gardening, were regularly entered with only the company officials' approval. Literature, historical writing, unless it was apparently political, and scientific books were in between. Some were licensed, some were not. Playtexts were rarely authorized, although if they were, it was usually with the master of the rebels' authority. So the playbook probably was the same thing that they had approved for performance. During Shakespeare's lifetime, censorship was then not particularly rigorous. And I, I know there are people that don't, they, they go, are you sure? <laughs> But yes, the few statutes that related to the written or word, printed or performed, dealt mostly with treason and sedition. It was treason to raise a rebellion against the crown, or to in any way suggest that the monarch was not properly entitled to be monarch. It was sedition to defame the monarch or her privy counselors. The, thus texts advocating that Mary Queen of Scots should be queen or that the succession was improper and therefore uh, the, the Elizabeth's succession was um, improper, were therefore punishable by law. Additionally, early in her reign, Elizabeth issued a proclamation that prohibited any mention of religion in stage plays. So, sedition, religion, and these are the things I'm gonna be talking about tonight. A bit later, she forbade writing about the royal succession, which I'm also gonna talk about tonight. We can better understand the nature of objections by looking at government efforts to uh, suppress offensive plays and books. In 1597, the play The Isle of Dogs was shut down. Its authors, Ben Johnson and Thomas Nash, both satirists, and two actors were imprisoned for sedition. And officials seized copies of the play from Nash's dwelling. No copies of the play survived, but the charge of sedition suggests that the play's satire was directed at the Queen and her privy counselors. Content Continental books that attacked Elizabeth's closest advisors, the Earl of Leicester and Lord Burley, were condemned, and every possible effort was made to suppress them, including searching the ships and warehouses at ports. Continental writers also produced a lot barrage of books attacking the English Reformation. Um, and within England, there were a, the, the Puritan party was very ready to use the press, and the established church went over its own Puritan members. So it, it's kind of, who gets censored is kind of an interesting thing. Um, actually, the question, and there's, there are some scholars who have said that um, staging a play with civil unrest or political rebellion was for, forbidden. And the case has been made that, that Richard II would have been censored, but well, it's very possible that one scene was censored in print, but most, most people who've worked on the play are pretty sure that it wasn't censored. And we'll see a little bit about that tonight. So the first play I will consider, Richard II, characters criticize the king and the play stages a political rebellion, but upholding the law of rule of law skillfully moderates such dangerous content. In the other two plays I considered, The Merchant of Venice and Othello, Lot is also central to the ways in which the plays manage provocative issues of religion and race. Richard II dramatizes contemporary concerns about government, the royal succession, the right to rule, and good government, right rule. The play begins with Richard II's first cousin <coughs> and son of John of Gaunt, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke, um, Henry Bolingbroke, uh, and I just left a word out, okay, Duke of Hereford, of rebelling against the king. Hereford, accusing Richard's henchman, Thomas Mowbray, of all the treasons of these 18 years. So you've got um, Richard's representative, Mowbray, and his cousin, and they're facing off each other, and his cousin, Henry, is, is accusing Richard's henchman of treason. And it gets, gets a little tricky. Um, the king proposes to resolve their differences, um, since they're both claiming treason, the king proposes a trial, to, a trial by personal combat, a chivalrous design of knightly trial, which a few scenes later, just as the parties are assembling for a joust, he curtails, and instead exiles Mowbray for, the, for life and Bolingbroke for 10 years. And I left this because we kind of need to know what's going on later. We have to know that Bolingbroke is exiled and he does come back illegally. Uh, we learn from a subsequent conversation between Gaunt Bolingbroke's father, and Gloucester's widow, the man that Richard has had killed, his <coughs> uncle, that if Mowbray murdered Gloucester, Richard was responsible. Even so, Gaunt here takes the position that nothing may be done about a bad king because he is God's representative on earth. 
As such, God's is the quarrel for God's substitute, Richard, caused Gloucester's death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. And this is de definitely holding the, the treason pos positions. To rebel against a rightful king, God's anointed, is to rebel against God. And Richard is the rightful king by the rule of primogeniture. He is the oldest. His father actually died before Edward, his, his grandfather. And so he became the king. So there's, there have been some people who have written about and saying that, well, maybe he wasn't fully. He was, he was completely the right ruler. Um, as rightful king, Richard says, not all the water in the rough, rude sea can wash the bomb off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. Deposition, though, is what the play is about, largely because Richard does not exercise right rule. Shortly after Henry Bolingbroke is exiled, God falls mortally ill, and he summons Richard to his bed, where he not only reproaches him for Gloucester's death, but also declares how Richard's ill rule disqualifies his right to rule. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son, Richard, should destroy his Edward's sons, killing Gloucester, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing me before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. So he's basically saying he can't be deposed, he shouldn't have been appointed, somehow Edward should have intervened um, but basically, and I'm mentioning this because I'm going to come back to it, um, is that what God is proposing that Richard is a bad enough king that he should just get out of the picture. Richard demonstrates the truth of, the truth of God's words when he learns of God's death. He callously comments, so much for that. Now for our Irish wars. And for these great affairs, we do cease to us the plate, corn, revenues and movables, whereof our uncle Gaunt would stand possessed. In other words, what should have been gone directly because of English law to his son, uh, Richard Caesar, from, for his own purposes. Just as he placed himself above the moral law by causing Gloucester's death, he here places himself above a fundamental principle of English law, which since the Magna Carta had secured English subjects' property rights. In the next scene, a conversation ensues among three English nobles about Richard III, Richard's ill rule and his subjects' massive dissatisfaction. Their complaints are that the king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers, who for hatred would have the king severely prosecute against our lives, our children, and our heirs, that the commons hath he pilled, and I think that's actually shorting for, should be, we would say piled, with grievous taxes, the nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels, and daily new exactions are devised as blank benevolence, that is, required contributions to the royal coffers. <laughs> Despite all this, and this is their description, the king's grown, grown bankrupt, like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. As for the people, they fear this fearful tempest sing. They, excuse me, they hear this fearful tempest sing yet see no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the winds that soar upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. Striking would, of course, be treason, which may or may not be the case with, Holling, with, with Henry Bolingbroke's return from exile. One of the nobles ends their conversation with the intelligence that Bolingbroke is returning to England in the company of eight English nobles. Their party has been well furnished by the Duke of Bretagne with eight tall ships and 3,000 men of war. Henry will, the nobles hope, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself. Is our scepter the king's scepter or the people's scepter? If it's the king's, is it gold, G-I-L-T, that's been hidden, or has the king's G-U-I-L-T been, been hidden? So the pun on this I mean, is, raises the kind of ambigu excuse me, ambiguous language that Shakespeare does again and again so you can see things as two possibilities. Henry Bolingbroke is coming to secure Richard's reformation or to replace him, we're not sure. When Henry arrives on English soil, his uncle, the Duke of York, whom Richard appointed King Regent while he was in the wars in Ireland, sends a messenger to greet him. The messenger says, my Lord of Hereford, my message is to you. Henry replies, my lord, my answer is, 
to Lancaster, which was his father's title. Am I come to seek that name in England? Just as the messenger begins to tell Henry of his uncle's concern, York appears, and to Henry's surprise, remark, my gracious uncle, um, and it stops out there, York replies, tut, tut, grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace is an ungracious mouth, is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs of thine dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more, why? Why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom? So York is right away giving us in the audience the view that Bolingbroke's a, tra a traitor. I mean, there's, you know, he's, this is one of the sides. But we get another side, too. Henry replies, he says, My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it therein? To which York replies, Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, Indeed, Henry's coming to England to raise rebellion against Richard is, is would it be the worst crime that could be committed against the king's right to rule. But Henry's next words indict Richard for committing the greatest crime against right rule that a king can commit against his citizens, violating the subject's legal rights. And this is Henry speaking. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. He bases his claim on the very law that made Richard king. He tells York, if that my cousin king be king of England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. This echoes the warning that York had given Richard upon learning of the seizing of Gaunt's goods. Take her for his right away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today, be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession. Um, he also warns him that the charters and the attorneys and all the things, there's all a full legal support for, for um, Lancaster, the lands being passed to his son. Richard, as we know, ignored York's warning and took the lands anyway. Henry informs his uncle when he returns to England and all of his letters, that although his letters patent to, to the title of Lancaster allow him legal recourse. He has been, been denied that option. I am denied to use my, sue my livery here, and yet my letters patent give me leave. What, he asks York, would he have him do? I am a subject, and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore, personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance. And what he means by personally here is in person. He's coming to claim this because he doesn't have any other recourse. When Henry subsequently discovers that Richard, upon his recent return from Ireland, has taken up residence in Flint Castle, on his behalf he sends Northumberland to the king to pledge his loyalty, provided his lands be freely restored and his banishment repealed. Richard sends Northumberland back with this reply. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without con contradiction. Afterwards, turning to his other cousin, York, York's son, Amel, Richard acknowledges that he has debased himself in sending such fair words uh, to Bolingbroke, and he asks if instead he should call Northumberland back and send defiance to the traitor and so die. Amel's reply, reply that they should fight with gentle words till time lend them friends and friends their helpful swords underscores Richard's isolation. When he had arrived, the Welsh army, which he had expected to support him, had all d deserted. Um, Bolingbroke uh, executed his favorites, the caterpillars of the kingdom, Bushy Baggett and Green, and York has, for all appearances, abandoned him. It is not surprising, then, that when Bolingbroke appears at Flint, on bended knee, says to Richard, my gracious lord, I come but for mine own, the king replies, your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. At the same time that Richard acknowledges Henry as his heir, he reminds him that his succession is not based on primogeniture. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. Richard then willingly gives up his crown. What you will have, I'll give and willingly too. And in doing so accomplishes what early on Gaunt had proposed as the only viable solution to Richard's crimes. He's deposed himself. 
This legal technicality resolves the place of apparent contradiction that a monarch is accountable only to God at the same time that he is subject to the law of the country. The law that makes him king, primogeniture, also protects his subjects. Deposing himself also addresses the problem of treason. Despite all the language in the play that casts Bolingbroke's return in, as treasonous rebellion by Richard's willing deposing, uh, deposing of himself, even in the face of force, Bolingbroke's actions come, cease to actually literally be treason. Shakespeare had a rather tricky problem with reconciling contemporary definitions of treason with the fact of history, that in history, Henry Bolingbroke did become King Henry IV. Had the play not turned on its legal technicality, Bolingbroke's treason would have succeeded, the, an idea that would have been anathema to Elizabethan politics. And by the way, it would certainly have brought the play to be censored. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned that some people thought that there's a later scene in the play that probably was performed but wasn't printed until the 17th century. There is a scene where Richard, Richard goes through a ritual of deposing, of taking off, off his crown and giving it and all of this. And people refer to this as the deposition scene. But I think what we just looked at shows that he has deposed himself already. He's the, the other one is ritual, but he has undone his own kingship. Um, Resolving dramatic conflict by legal nuance may not be entirely satisfactory to us as an audience, but it is a useful means to address on stage difficult, timely concerns. As we can see from Elizabeth's prohibition against religion as a subject for stage plays, we might expect Shakespeare to shy away from the topic. He doesn't. Several plays have puritanical characters that satirize the radical wing of the English church, but these are usually lighthearted allusions to religion which the master of the revels might actually have applauded. Um, the court tended to not be quite as puritanical. A much more serious treatment of the state's relationship to religion appears in The Merchant of Venice. Like Richard II, The Merchant of Venice's action develops from unresolvable differences. <coughs> here between the Christian merchant Antonio and the Jewish moneylender Shylock. From Shylock's perspective, Antonio's practice of lending money without interest lowers the rate of interest to the detriment of Shylock's business, which the end of the play makes clear is the only livelihood open to Shylock in Venice. When the Duke, at the end of the play, when the Duke proclaims Shylock's penalty for seeking the life of a nation, a fine of all that he owns, Shylock says, nay, take my life and all, pardon not that, you take my house when you do take the prop that doth re sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means by which I live. Antonio's contempt for Shylock is unvarnished anti-Semitism that is particularly offensive because of its public expression to the, within the merchant community in which both Antonio and Shylock do business. Antonio, Shylock says, hates our sacred nation, and he rails even where, there where merchants most do congregate, which would be the Rialto. On me, my bargain and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Despite his contempt for Shylock's lending practices, Antonio's <coughs> business interests force him to ask Shylock for a loan on behalf of his kinsman Bassanio. Antonio's financial resources are tied up in trading ships at sea. When Shylock asks us to Antonio why he should lend money to someone who he says called me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spat upon my Jewish gabardine, Antonio replies, I am as like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. A considerable amount of ink has been spent on whether or not the bond Shylock makes with Antonio for, um, for a pound of flesh, for in, in, if, the, if he defaults on the loan of 3,000 ducats, was made in earnest. And, and I, I mean, and here I think it's really difficult because um, It's, it's so subtly presented, and there, you have some laughing and some, I'm gonna read this to you, some laughing and some friendship. If you want to see Shylock as vicious from the beginning, it can be performed that way, and there's, there are things in the play that work that way, but there's an awful lot that doesn't. Um, at the beginning, at least, the proposition of a pound of flesh, if should Antonio for, become forfeit, um, seems amiably made. Shylock tells Antonio he will forget the shames that you have stained me with, supply your present wants, and take no dwad of usance from my monies. Shylock calls the bond a merry sport, and Antonio says he will seal to such a bond and say there is much kindness in the Jew. 
When Bassanio protests that Antonio should not agree to a bond on his, to this kind of a bond on his behalf, Antonio says, why, fear not, man, I will not forfeit it. In two months, a month before Shylock's 3,000 ducats become due, he expects a return on his investments nine times greater than the loan. Um, so Antonio is pretty confident, confident. The spirit of mutual toleration, of course, does not last. All Antonio's ships are lost and the bond is forfeit. But meanwhile, Shylock has experienced a much greater loss. Before Shylock hears about Antonio's mis misfortunes, and this is in sequence in the play, he doesn't yet know about them. Um, he discovers that his daughter Jessica, whom he twice calls my flesh and blood, has stolen some money and two jewels and eloped with a Christian. Solanio, who's uh, this guy who's always on the tr street and is useful to tell us what's happening when the stage, Shakespeare doesn't want to stage it. Solanio reports Shylock's delirium over his loss. He has, he says, never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable as the dog Jew did utter in the streets. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh my Christian duc ducats, justice the law, my ducats, and my daughter. Shylock here confounds his life and livelihood, um, his life, his daughter being his life, and his ducats being his livelihood. Um, Solanio aptly observes that Antonio will suffer for Shylock's loss. Let good Antonio keep his, look he keep his day, or he shall pay for this. So this is all before what we know. The man who seeks to enforce his bond against Antonio's forfeit is a man whose loss first breaks him and then hardens him against Christians. Shakespeare elicits our sympathy for Shylock in the scene where Tubal, a member of his synagogue whom Shylock has sent in search of Jessica, reports his findings. He has not found her, but by report she is spending money freely in Genoa and give, even traded for a monkey a ring. Shylock's response is poignant. Out upon her, thou torturest me, Tubal. It was my turquoise. I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. Immediately afterwards, Tubal tells Shylock that Antonia is certainly undone. Shylock's response is, tells Tubal to summon an officer. He's going to go after law. So I, I think that there's this, a real subtle shift here, but it's an important shift. Shylock is intent on having his bond. In the street where he encounters Antonio, he would plead for money. Who would plead for money? Shylock refuses even to let Antonio speak. I'll have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. That Shylock is entitled to justice is without question, since after he leaves the street scene and Salerno seeks to reassure Antonio that the Duke will surely never grant this forfeiture to hold, Antonio explains the rule of law in Venice. The Duke cannot deny the course of law. For the commodity that strangers have with us in Venice, if it be denied, will much impeach the justice of the state, since that the trade and profit of the city consisteth of all nations, um, excuse, since, the, since the trade and profit of the city consisteth of all nations. In other words, the law governing bonds and financial transactions have to be let stand, otherwise business can't stand. This is a position that Shylock later alludes to, and which in the court scene addressing the bond, Portia disguised as Balthazar affirms. And Portia appears as, in, as Balthazar, the young justice, is going to help decide the, the legal issues in this. When Shylock appears before the Duke to proceed against Antonio, he says, I have possessed your grace of what I propose, and by our holy Sabbath have I sworn to have the due and forfeit of my bond. If you deny it, let the danger light upon your charter and your city's freedom. So he recognizes if the bond's not recognized, the city's in trouble. The danger, Portia later explains, there is no power in Venice can alter a decree established, which will be recorded for a precedent, and many an heir by the same example will rush to, into the state. It cannot be. Since justice must be both constant and blind, the only alternative is mercy, as Portia uh, poetically, excuse me, as Portia's poetically compelling speech to Shylock explains, and this is the famous, the quality of mercy is not strange, it droppeth to the gentle rain from heaven, um, and it closes with it is the, the attribute of God himself. The problem for Shylock, though, is that based on the religious nature of his oath, mercy is not an option. 
He has, he reminds us many times, sworn an oath in heaven and on the Sabbath. An oath, an oath, I have my oath in heaven. Shall I lay perjury on my soul? No, not for Venice. According to the Torah, um, Genesis 10, God will not leave unpunished someone who uses his name lightly in this situation, who swears by his name. Um, moreover, God blessed the Sabbath and separated it for himself. So having sworn an oath on the Sabbath to keep his bond, Shylock is even further under God's law. Shylock faces the double bind a religious person faces when God's law and the law of the state make contradictory demands. Besides that, fulfilling one's oath in a matter of blood revenge draws a fine line between killing and murder. Shylock has already noted the problem with revenge. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should he suffer it's by his Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute. How this eye for an eye can be reconciled with a call for mercy um, certainly makes the conflict resolution not particularly satisfactory. In the place court scene, since it becomes clear that mercy is not an option, Portia upholds Shylock's position, and indeed Venice's, that law must prevail. Portia asks to see the bond, and though she proclaims that Shylock is entitled to a pound of Antonio's flesh, she finds fault with the legal document itself that makes it so, that makes it so. Tarry a little, she says, there is something else. This bond <coughs> doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou a pound of flesh, but in the cutting of, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate under the state of Venice. When Portia assures him that this is the law, Shylock has second thoughts and offers to allow Bassanio to pay twice the amount due him and let Antonio go. Here Portia insists that because Shylock demanded the law, he must accept the law, and the law is more than he knows. The law hath yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice, if it be proved against an alien, that's an important word, that by direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen, the party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half his goods, the other half comes to the privy coffer of the state. And the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duke. In which predicament I say thou standest. For an alien, someone outside of Venice's dominant citizen culture, to even plan or contrive against the life of a citizen is a capital crime. This strangely echoes the language of English sedition and treason law. The Duke, showing mercy, pardons Shylock's life and confiscates his wealth, half to Antonio and half to the state, and turns to Antonio to ask what mercy he can show. Antonio requests that the fine to the state be waived, but that half of Shylock's goods come to him, which he will manage for his lifetime, um, and on his death convey to Jessica and her husband on, one con on two conditions. Shylock must become a Christian, and he must enter a deed that names Lorenzo and Jessica as heirs to the half he retains. And seeing how he regarded his daughter's elopement, this is just sort of a really rubbing sand, you know, salt in the wound. The question of Jews in England during Shakespeare's time, and for this play, is vexed. Most sources explain anti-Semitism by referring to the 1290 <coughs> law expelling Jews from England, even though historical studies have established a continuing Jewish presence, particularly in Shakespeare's London. Nearly 100 years ago, the Jewish Historical Society published a well-researched scholarly article by Lucien Wolfe that established a Portuguese Murano community in the area of the Tower of London, many of whose members were trained diplomats and prominent traders and bankers. They even, some of them actually represented England, uh, the Queen in some of, the, in some of her um, embassies. Muranos, forced out of Portugal and Spain by the Inquisition to their countries of exile, summoned the new role of quote unquote, new Christians, those who outwardly um, religiously conformed to Christianity, but who practiced Judaism at home. Wolf concludes that Jews were quite free to live in Elizabethan England, so long as they did not break the law or outrage public sentiment in regard to religion. He also points out that since the Portuguese were identified with Spain and Spain was England's enemy, the Murano community could not have escaped government scrutiny. And this was, and so there, there was no secret then about the Muranos actually practicing their religion in private, um, but 
not, and getting any outward conformity. Um, as in Venice, since that the trade and profit of the city consisted of all nations, English Jewish Muranas were not the target of either harsh laws or much anti Semitism. I raise the question of Jews' status in Shakespeare's London because I think Shakespeare is doing quite a good bit more in Merchant of Venice than weighing portions of question of who is the merchant and who is the Jew. I think it's exploring what happens when the dominant religion uses the law against the religious other, an important Shakespeare issue in Shakespeare's England, where the question of who was the Protestant, who the Catholic, was central. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, England passed increasingly punitive laws against Catholic recusants. Um, the injunctions Elizabeth published when she came to the throne in 1558 explicitly forbade language that stigmatized Catholics. But after 1570, when the Pope, having declared Elizabeth a heretic, absolved her Catholic subjects of any crimes against her, including murder, religious difference became a problem. Continental Catholicism launched the Catholic mission to secretly minister to English Catholics, and the mission's illegal tracts specified that a Catholic's outward conformity to England's law requiring a church attendance was heretical, a damnable sin. Recusancy laws repeatedly raised the financial stakes for English Catholics by imposing increasing fines for non-attendance at church. This resembles Shylock's situation. The financial penalties imposed on Shylock are so excessive that they threaten his livelihood, but for him to break away from his bond violates his religious principles. English Catholics, like Shylock, were in a double bind. They could be loyal to the government and retain their livelihood or lose everything for adhering to their religion. In a Christian nation, in a Christian nation how can two religions' commitment to the same God mark difference? In Venice, who indeed is the merchant and who the Jew? In England, who is the Christian and who the, who is the Christian? How can civil law impose a given religion or religious practice on its people? How can the Christian merchant or less mer deem it less merciful than the Jew? Shakespeare could not have staged a play in which a religious other, Catholic rather than Jew, had to confront the English state's religious, uh, rigorous religious read Protestant law. So in its place, he wrote a play that uses the law to resolve the play's dramatic conflict at the same time, it challenges the justice and that can sometimes be the justice of law. Richard II and the Merchant of Venice look, are able to look seriously, if obliquely, at contemporary politics and religion under the cover of law. In Othello, a play whose structure is inexorably and disastrously forensic, the law is unspoken and even to some degree ambiguous. Under martial law, imposed on a faraway Mediterranean island, Othello, general who is then in martial law ruling the island, tries, convicts, and executes Desdemona for committing adultery, he thinks. From the 12th century, English legal system was uh, uh, understood to oppose under the premise that truth was attained through a rational evidentiary pr process. That is, they took, if, if something was presented as evidence in the court of law, it could be the, come the truth. This is the process of work in Othello. At Iago's first mention of the word jealousy, Othello's response both insists he will not live a jealous life and also establishes the, the forensic structure of the plot. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. When I doubt, prove, and on the proof, there is no more but this, a way at once with love or jealousy. In the course of the play, Othello will be made to see with his mind's eye his wife's sexual infidelity leading him to a doubt her, and when he doubts her, he demands proof that she has been unfaithful. Having the proof, he ends both love and jealousy by killing Desdemona, else she'll betray more men. Critics have often seen Othello as a tragedy of irrational, jealous passion, but this passage shows Othello to be relentlessly rational. He knows precisely how he will proceed. Iago's extraordinarily brilliant deceptions and manipulations of evidence, rather than Othello's jealousy, drive the play's action. Without Iago, Othello, whose hero's nature was neither jealous nor impassioned, would necessarily have ended differently. In Act 4, after Othello strikes Desdemona, a public act demonstrating a man perplexed to the extreme, the Venetian emissary, Lodovico, attests to Othello's former imperturbable nature when he asks, is this the noble Moor whom our full senate call in all and all sufficient? Is this the nature whom passion could not shake? 
This is the way Othello sees himself in Act 3, when in response to Iago's mention of jealousy, he proclaimed, no, to be once in doubt is once to be resolved. Jealousy comes from uncertainty, and Othello in insists having the least suspicion would require that he learn the truth. The play's action has Othello become Desdemona's relentlessly rational jury, judge, and ex executioner. This is not to say he is not jealous, but Othello's jealousy is wrought and perplexed in the extreme by a mastermind's trap. Othello understandably accepts the observations and counsel of a man he believes to be his most trusted comrade because the man brilliantly employs heavenly shows. Significantly, Othello does not jump to conclusions. He demands proof. Shortly after the thought of Desdemona's infidelity becomes plausible to Othello, Iago appears, reappears on the stage and seeing Othello distraught asks, is it possible, my lord? In response, Othello takes Iago by the throat and says, villain, be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof or by the worth of mine eternal soul. And that's a kind of a Shakespeare's preparing us there. Thou hadst better have been born a dog than answer my naked wrath. Othello, if, if, if Iago is lying, Othello will kill Iago. It, Iago responds with a scoff. And he's, if, you, if you read carefully, because he has all of these wonderful um, soliloquies, so he, we, we as the audience know these other things. But when you read this and you read sort of, you can almost hear the tone of his voice. Whenever he's talking to Othello, he's, you can hear the tone that he's being really nice and making himself look really good. And then the minute he, afterwards, when he goes into a soliloquy, he says these horrible things. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have this, we as an audience have this, this wonderful two-sidedness, but Othello doesn't have that advantage. Um, when Iago scoffs, as it come to this, Othello says, make me to see it, or at the least to prove it, that the probation bear no hinge or loop to hang a doubt on or woe upon thy life. Um, given this entree, so he basically says, it's kind of almost like, it's not a dare, but he's saying, you better start proving this. Iago comes up with one of the most skillful um, scenes in the play. Um, given this entree, Iago, pretending he does not like the office, carefully baits his hook with the story of Cassio's dream, when he had lately lay with Cassio. And um, lay with the fact of two men being in bed together in, Shakespeare's England was not necessarily a sexual situation. There was, you know, you go to an inn, pe people would share a room. So that was not the sexual thing, but Iago turns it into it. <laughs> there was a kind, there are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleeps will mutter their affairs. One of this kind is Cassio. In sleep, I heard him say, sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves, and then, sir, would he grip and wring my hand, cry, oh sweet creature, then kiss me hard, as if he plucked up kisses by the root that grew upon my lips, lay his leg over my thigh, and sigh and kiss, and then cry, cursed fate that gave thee to the more. Iago's description intends a complex psychological effect. Besides asking Othello to imagine Desdemona's infidelity, he must also picture a homosexual encounter between Cassio and Iago. Othello's recoil at the idea of Cassio's soul's laxity extends far beyond the liveliness of the dreams of Desdemona. Iago immediately uses Othello's revulsion to further turn the screw. He tells Othello not to regard this as proof, but as something to help thicken other proofs. Proofs he will supply through Desdemona's handkerchief, spotted with strawberries, her gift from Othello. Iago says he has seen the handkerchief in Cassio's hands, and this is right in the same scene, um, implying Desdemona has given it to him when in fact having that he had had his wife steal it. Iago hid in Cassio, and this is a little later, Iago hid, in, hid it in Cassio's chamber. Iago then stages a scene for a hidden Othello, and Othello, you, know, you, you see he's definitely behind the scenes, um, and he can't fully hear everything that's said. So and so he, he thinks that they're talking about um, Cassio and Desdemona, when in fact, Iago is talking to Cassio about uh, Bianca, who's a prostitute. Um, so this is really sounding really terrible. Um, uh, it, there's a ribald conversation. Um, Iago convinces Othello it's about Desdemona, and, Bi Bi and then Bianca enters, handkerchief in hand, and berates Cassio for giving her such a gift. 
Shortly after this, Iago tells the fellow the lie, and it's a straight out for the lie, that Cassio said he had lain with this Desdemona. With her, on her, what you will. Iago manipulates the fellow to see the damning connection between his lie about Cassio's words and the handkerchief. Iago has proven Othello's love a whore. Once Othello has proof, he does not murder Desdemona in a fit of jealous rage. Instead, certain of but sorry for the justice he must perform, he commits to her execution. When Othello confronts the necessity of killing Desdemona, he reacts, but yet the pity of it, Iago, a sentiment he carries to her death. Then he counters himself, yet she must stay, else she will be Jerry Marman, with the recognition that her balmy breath doth almost persuade justice to break her sword. And so he's seeing his act as an act of justice, not passion. Othello's language here has seemingly perverse notions of justice have proven to be one of the play's most problematic features. Has Othello's jealous rage made him mad? Is this the monstrous misogyny of Shakespeare's society? Does Othello abandon justice for self-justification? To consider how a contemporary audience may have responded, I want to turn to the play's problem that's, that through its forensic structure, it lacks explicit reference to what law has been broken. Indeed, one of the reasons Othello's claims about proof and justice pose a problem for modern readers is the disparity between the crime, infidelity, and its punishment, death. And we assume Shakespeare's audiences with that agreed with him. Um, such a dire punishment, though, would have been familiar to the play's contemporary audience, who would have heard of it lauded in the homily against adultery that was read regularly in church. In Shakespeare's time, the Church of England required that any religious service where no licensed preacher was available to preach a sermon, which was often, a homily should be read from the Book of Homilies. Most of the homilies explain Protestant teaching on the nature of salvation, with one exception, the homily entitled Against Whoredom and Adultery. This unusual turn for which the homily apologizes is necessitated by the current prevalence of adultery and fornication and whoredom. Adultery, says the homilist, is a sin of most abomination, and great is the damnation that hangeth over the heads of fornicators and adulterers. The homily against whoredom and adultery is broken down into three separate sermons, the third of which praises civil punishments throughout history. Civil, and we're not talking about religious, we're talking about civil. And the authors of these acts were no Christians, but heathens, yet were they so inflamed with the love and honesty and pureness of life that for the maintenance and conservation of keeping up of that their godly statutes, including those among the Arabians, where they that were taken adultery had their heads struck from their bodies. Shakespeare's audience then, in church, heard praise for foreign laws that punished adultery with death, and by referring to Arabians, connected some of these to Islamic law. Shakespeare's play clearly establishes Othello the Moor has connections to, the, to, to Islam. The law governing adultery in Othello, um, and the laws governing adultery, adultery and Othello are not mentioned, but they are implicit in the moral dichotomy the play sets between Venetians and the outsider Othello. Italians in the play are remarkably tolerant of adultery and fornication. Cassio has a liaison with a courtesan. Uh, of Venetian women, Iago says, I know our country's dis disposition well. In Venice, they do not, excuse me, in Venice, they do let God see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to leave it undone, but to keep it unknown. Amelia calls adultery a small vice. Othello's attitude toward adultery, like his identity, is markedly different from the Venetians. This appears when he first considered the implications of, of Desdemona's infidelity. If I do poor her haggard, though her jesses were my dear heartstrings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray to fortune. Happily, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have. So he's cutting himself off from, from, from Venetians. Chamberers here refer to the courtly life of Venice, a milieu that prized genteel conversation and that tolerated sexual licentiousness. Othello distinguishes himself from this word, world because he happens to be black. That is, by the nature of his origins, cultural and geographical, he is a black man. In juxtaposing his black nature to the licentious world of Venice, Othello identifies intoler his intolerance for adultery with the word world of his origins. From this perspective, Othello's moment of tragic recognition looks quite different from rationalization for murder. In the fifth act, just after Desdemona's death, Amelia accuses Othello of being rash as fire for saying Desdemona was false. 
Oh, proclaims Amelia, she was heavenly true. Othello replies, Cassio did top her, ask thy husband else. Oh, I were damned beneath all depth in hell, but that I did proceed upon just grounds to this ex extremity. And I think what she reminds me here is that right there Othello is saying, if I didn't have just grounds and I have killed her, I'm damned. And that, you know, so he's got this, this dimension. As acting governor in Cyprus, Othello was responsible for enacting justice, as I said, and several other places in the play indicated. Given the homilies praise for the zealous punishment of adulterers, for Othello to have believed he was acting on just grounds may be seen less as an act of self-deception and self-justification than as the action of a man who, in the words of the homilist, inflamed with the love of honesty and pureness of life, acted. When Othello grasps the enormity of Iago's lies, he asks why the heavens have not rained down their wrath on Iago. And there are, no, are, are there no stones in heaven but what serve for thunder? Precious villain. Shortly thereafter, he recognizes that heaven's wrath will fall on him because the just grounds he had found for Desdemona's death were Iago's fabrications. Looking upon Desdemona's body, he says, O oh, ill-starred wrench, pale as thy smock, when we shall meet at Comte, judgment day, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch at it. Here Othello envisions the tragic consequences of his refusal to suffer adultery to reign. He is a man whose love of honesty and pureness of life brought him not to the just grounds of Desdemona's punishment, but to now what he recognizes as the damning sin of her murder. He, touches out, he reaches out to touch Desdemona, and feeling her as cold as he said as her chastity, he calls upon devils to whip him from the heavenly sight of her. He bids the devils blow me about in the winds, roast me in sulfur, wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. What began in Othello's mind as an act of justice against his adulterous wife is now a damnable crime for which justice demands that he can he kill himself. And he says, no way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss. Um, I'm going to leave this little, this little section out, it's, and then I want to come to my conclusion. I've considered three plays that engage socially divisive issues in Shakespeare's time and in ours, invoking the nature of the rule of law for Shakespeare becomes a means, if not to resolve differences, that at least to ground difficult, if, if not to resolve differences, then at least to ground difficult conversations, to produce civil weighing of the issues at hand. Furthermore, his character development dramatizes the complexity of the issues he is engaging. We can, I think, learn from both. In closing, I want to return to John Douglas Thompson and Farrah Curran Cooper. In all fairness, Curran Cooper does not see canceling Shakespeare as viable, but instead proposes that we reconcile ourselves to Shakespeare's flaws and limitations regarding racism, but not without openly facing it. Thompson agrees that we should be open and honest, even though he finds Curran Cooper's inclination to see every use of black and white as a construction of race. Um, in this, any time, you know, anything that's, that's um, fair is white, and anything that has any kind of darkness or evil or anything is black. And, it, it, and, and Thompson regularly says, he says, it just goes a little too far. Thompson has performed both Shylock and Othello, and I would love to see him perform Bolingbroke. And I think he makes a strong case against canceling Shakespeare. While I found racism, racism, this is, these are his words, while I found racism, I also found complex characters who took my breath away with their great depth and astonishing humanity. Shakespeare's words contain multitudes of meanings, ideas, and emotions that in my black body become mutable and ancestral, shifting with time, intention, context, perception, and culture. Um, and I didn't purposely didn't spend some time about talking about race in Shakespeare because we're going to talk about that in the seminar on Saturday. But I wanted to focus primarily I mean, in, in Othello because I wanted to pro, pro, focus primarily on the question of the law. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> and I would be happy to answer any questions if I can. I should say, uh, you were looking at the clock. The law school is still on daylight savings. I knew that. <laughs> but, uh, but I, you um, know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dense material here. I think you, you, that can go be a little long. Uh, so uh, questions? Um, I want to ask you two things about when he strikes uh, uh, Desdemona, Othello, at the end in front of everybody, that's before he's, so as a judge, is he making a pre-decision? And on the second end, 
at the end when he kills himself, before he kills himself, he tells a story of how he rescued a Venetian from a Turk, I think it is, and that is he then executing himself in the stipulation? So. Yeah, of and I think the interesting part is, is that in, there's early in the play, um, Othello tells about, in, in, in fact, it's in the court in, in Venice, um, in front of, of the uh, Doge, he tells how he got to know Desdemona, and, and, and um, you know, how he often visited the house and knew her father well, and then he tells about a story that he was taken into slavery and then ransomed by, by Christians. And this gets really kind of tricky. But if you understand that, if you put Othello as a Moor, North Africa, okay, the Turks were having this huge incursion at this time. And actually, at the time that, um, the, that probably the source was written, um, the biggest threat in Europe was Turkish invasion. And of course, that's the threat in, in, in the play. And so um, he sees himself in that scene as that, it, uh, there's a really good article on this, that, that he is turned Turk. And I don't think that's entirely it, but he, if he sees himself as he's turned back to his sources and not, it's not a good thing. So he has to kill himself. Yes? Could you speak to the connection between uh, Richard II and the supporters of Essex? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, there's, again, this is one of those things that there's a lot of ink. Um, there was a performance. Better give a little background. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, let me just. Um, in 1601, one of Elizabeth's courtiers, one of her, you know, one of her favorites, um, he had been appointed in 1599 to lead Elizabeth's forces in Ireland, and he had, he, uh, Essex. <coughs> And he had some. He had got into some problems, um, and he came back to England illegally. And he had this great breach with the queen, um, and he, he kept trying, writing over and over and again to get back into her favor. Um, and so there was a real breach within the court. And the nature of this, the Essex Rebellion, which was in 1601, it's really messy because there's some suggestion that he was provoked by some of Elizabeth's courtiers. Um, at any rate, he will marched into the streets, not raising a rebellion, but with, with several people supporting him. Um, and he was going, his view was he was trying to make a statement and talk to the queen. Uh, it would be a little bit like what, you, you know, what, what, what Bolingbroke says, you know, I tried to have law, but I have to do it in person because I can't get through law. <laughs> but the important thing, and I, that I, so Essex was in fact arrested and he was prosecuted under the treason laws and was executed. Um, the night before the Essex Rebellion, there was a performance of Richard II, and there's a huge debate that, you know, there's a couple of British scholars who say, no, it was not this play Richard II, it was something else, or someone, that no, this was something that had been made up. You know, I don't, I don't know if it was in fact performed, but the important thing is that this play was written before the Essex Rebellion. My personal theory is the reason this play can stage rebellion is because the Essex Rebellion hasn't happened. And it, it, the Essex Rebellion put it so deeply into the English imagination that people looking back on it, on, on Richard II, see it as part of a whole tradition. Where I really, I, I went through all of, this is a fun project, I went through all of the contemporary histories and summaries of histories and uh, Hancho, all of these, and it's, it, it's just not, rebellion is not as big a charged thing in the histories and in Richard II as it becomes after the Essex Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I guess along those lines, uh, you know, the way you're talking about the way Shakespeare is able to subtly bring certain subjects that he might not have been able to do, you know, more openly. Did that uh, pressure change after Elizabeth's death when, when James became king? Was there a different stance towards that? Um, well, I think that it continues um, because the religious problems continue. And some of his, um, some of his other problem comedies very much address the, an England where there's this religious divide, and sometimes religion is hypocritical, and there's dislike for the fact that the state 
affects religion, even though it, it, it does, but it's not a theocracy. So I would say it, it's not just Elizabeth's death. I mean, I think it's true in both Elizabethan and Jacobean England that um, there are issues, some of the issues contained, the concern about trees and the concern about the state um, and religion. And I think Shakespeare finds ways to talk about them in some other plays too. The system of uh, censorship remained as you described it? Yes. conversation about Portia. I mean, to really treat the play, you have to treat her. Um, she's coming on behalf of someone, a well-respected lawyer, and so she's it's like, sort of like her, his clerk. Yeah. So I, I think that she's entitled to be there, but um, but I would sort of say, yeah, the, the, the whole last scene, the whole scene with Portia and the judgment is really enough of a problem. And it's, it does twist back and forth the question of uh, who's, who's, in this case, who's the Christian, who's the Jew, who has mercy and who doesn't have mercy. And her, her, her indictment is pretty merciless. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, Now, well, this is a really interesting. In, I, I, that could have that could have been a whole paper on Shakespeare's fathers and, and daughters. Um, I, that is one of the issues I think that Shakespeare is often c confronting. Um, it's very if you look at Taming of the Shrew, um, her, uh, Catherine's father just basically makes the agreement with her, with um, Petruchio without any con consultation. So. It, the practice was, in fact, women were under their father's purview. In Shakespeare's England, women had an amazing amount of, especially aristocratic women, had some ability to say no to their father's proposals of marriage. So Desdemona, technically, yes, would be under her father's control. But the, in this court scene, she makes this wonderful argument that you know she has already married Othello. And just as my mother owed her obedience to her husband, you, I now owe my obedience to my husband, Othello. Um, so marriage shifted who, who, who owned a woman. But before she got married, it, the pastor Othello stole her from the sea. And that's what Iago is screaming, thieves, thieves, somebody stole your spouse. Mm -hmm. What, in? In the scene one. In, in Othello. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so that's that's one of the things. Who's screaming this? It's it's Iago, yeah. and Iago is raising, doing. Well, he, he's also this is the same scene where he has very um, explicit description of the sexual act between Desdemona and Othello, and he does it in racial terms. I mean, Othello is. I mean, uh, Iago is the racist in the play, so he's. I don't think he's making a legitimate claim to. The father, yeah, it's a fair claim, but I think what 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 Iago is working on is a lot of other things at the same time. So I'm, I mean, if if and I, thought, I think I think probably since the Doge, the, this whole case, the, the the father takes it before the Doge. They go to court, which is the equivalent of a law court because it's the Doge is, impress, is present. And he makes the case that his daughter has been stolen from him, and it, the daughter's wrong. And that's when Othello presents his case, and Desdemona presents her case, and the Doge sides with Othello and Desdemona, not with the father. And I think that's probably important. But the father disagrees. He tells Othello, watch out for her. She, she betrays me, she will betray you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. That, I mean, that's how it, this, the play. Puts up two or three at the two ideas at the same time. Yeah. 
just interesting also then to compare across to the other Venice play you're talking about uh, and the question of Jessica being stolen and stealing herself away, stealing her parents' property, her father's property. It seems to me Shakespeare is creating a nice complicated set of questions there about exactly which thing is property and which isn't between the daughter and other kinds of possessions. I think so. And, and I like the fact in, I mean, in, in, the, in uh, the case of Jessica, um, the father's love, you know, my daughter, she's my, my life. And it's, it's not, that's not just possession, it's love. You know, that she's everything for him. Um, so, it's, it, yeah, I, it, it's, it is definitely an issue in Shakespeare's time and one that gets played with a lot. But it, and, and I don't think he has, I can't say this is what he thinks. Yes, just parental rights. What? Parental rights. <laughs> that's yeah. That's a subject that carries forward. Yeah. yeah would, would it not be? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it's dangerous to say anything about the Merchant of Venice in my presence because I have <laughs> strong views on the Merchant of Venice. Um, and I, I think you said uh, that um, you think that the question of uh, justice <coughs> and mercy is really not resolved in the play. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not really dealt with completely. Is that... Did I misunderstand you? No, no, I don't. I don't think. It, I don't think this resolved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't think it's. Um, I, I think that um, for some reason, just about all commentators who've written about the Merchant of Venice look at the trial scene and they act as if they are one of the people in the in the courtroom, and a person in the courtroom quite naturally thinks that she is making this eloquent plea for mercy in order to save Antonio. But that's clearly wrong. Uh, once we've seen the play once, we know Antonio is not in any danger at all. Mm -hmm. Because she knows what's coming. Uh, so what is she doing besides creating a very dramatic scene, which she certainly does quite well for Shakespeare. And what she's doing is exercising mercy towards Shylock, because Shylock is in jeopardy of his life. He is in this trap, which he has put himself into, uh, and so um, the, uh, uh, the famous line, the quality of mercy is not strained, constrained means compelled, so the quality of mercy is not compelled. But Portia's previous line to that is, then must the Jew be merciful? which is saying the Jew is compelled to be merciful. They seem to be contradictory, but they are not because of the trap that Shylock has put himself into, which is if he's not merciful, if he does not back off, he, he's, he's going to be he's subject to execution. Uh, but if anybody tells him that, if, if, if somebody says, oh, you have to do this, otherwise look what's ahead for you, it's too late because he's not, he's not pulling himself out. The only way he can save himself is to voluntarily uh, relent. It would, and, be like, it, would, it would be like Richard deposing himself. And, uh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I think that the, the, the question there, and you touched on this, but I didn't think you, I, mean, I think you might, I'd be interested, maybe you, you will expand on a little more, um, I don't think, in law, we generally think that a, uh, uh, an action that is coerced, now there's a question of how much coercion is yeah. necessary and, and what constitutes yeah. coercion, but if, you know, if you say, uh, if, I, if I hold, you know, take the old Jack, if I hold a, gun, a gun to your head and I say, your money or your life, and you give me your wallet, say, I can't go out and say, wait a minute, this is my wallet. She gave it to me voluntarily. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think there's a question there. But in The Merchant of Venice, um, if, if you look at it that way, that she has made every effort to save him, which is an act of mercy, because if she were after him, she could have just let him go. I mean, you know, yeah. she, uh, but she gave him 
the chance, and she used some of the most eloquent language ever written in the history of the English language, uh, to try to persuade him to do it. Um, so uh, I, I think that then, um, uh, and he is spared. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that, uh, um, I don't know, I, I think that uh, the, the question of justice and mercy is resolved in that scene in a very different way than most people have recognized. So I just am interested um, yeah. Just a, a word about Othello. Um, uh, he refer, you quote it, you referred to this quote, I think it's very important, when he says, uh, uh, when uh, he, he used the word the comp, on judgment day, when I'm there and uh, Desdemona is there, uh, she's gonna cast me down to hell. But that is clearly wrong, because we know, and he knows, that her last words were something to the effect of, commend my gracious Lord. Mm -hmm. She had forgiven him. At the very yeah, moment yeah, okay. that he was killing her, she forgave him. And I think that his failure is at the end that he goes ahead and kills himself, whereas what he should do is get down on his knees and repent and uh, pray for mercy. Uh, and you know, clearly, I mean, you know, it's Christianity 101, if he does that, he will be saved despite this monstrous uh, sin that he has committed. So I, I think that's the, um, that to me is the crucial moment uh, for Othello. It's not even when he kills her, although obviously it would have been better if he hadn't done yeah. that, uh, but, it, but it's, it, it's at that last moment. So uh, that wasn't a question I guess. No, no that's I, fine, I that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? I'm just wondering, you know, I, as a Jew, in today's age of what I'd consider rabid racism and bigotry and murderous anti-Semitism on university campuses, that people are daring to approach Shakespeare with an effrontery of he's a racist, he's a bigot, he's an anti-Semite, versus one of the greatest, most holy writers of human writing. And these crazy characters and that I don't think he's saying you should emulate him in this. This is how we don't live. Yeah, and, I think that's true. And so that there is an outrage, not only for Shakespeare, but for Mark Twain, or for uh, George Orwell, for you know, so many writers, Faulkner, they, they, they want to point to, there's a bigotry and a racism here when they themselves are practicing such horror and hate I find it with reprehensible. I don't know if anybody's written about this. And go, who, who are you to attack me here? Under under what right do you attack, attack this? And, and that's why I mean that's kind of what I think about about Merchant of Venice. It, people keep referring to Good Antonio, and you can use any name you want to, but you don't really see him do anything good in the play. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, people they they all follow him, and and he, you do see him. His behavior is pretty repre reprehensible towards Shylock. But I'm talking more about Shakespeare. Th that oh. we, we are thinking that we should be making a negative judgment of some sort. It, and it's, a, it's such, it's such, so hopelessly hypocritical. It, it's so self-serving, mm -hmm. uh, another agenda. And I, I think that really needs to be strongly opposed. Could I speak to that one? When you, when you look at uh, the characters of Othello and Shylock in the context of the period, um, taking away our racism, um, Shylock, unlike the Jew of Malta, Marlowe's play, is a human being. Yeah. And Shakespeare plays him as a human being, which seems to me almost dangerous if you think that the audience of Shakespeare is going to assume that Shylock is a, a, a bad Jew, an alien person, then this is a rather dangerous aspect to, to humanizing and humanize Othello. Othello is a very human character, and it's, huma it's his humanity that brings him down, not his race, despite the fact that he talks about In fact, when I first started working on Othello, 
Um, one of the things that struck me is that, that you know, if you're just taking the conventions of the writing of the time, it's a tragedy. And, you know, a, a tragedy does not work if you don't like the tragic hero. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and so Othello is, I think, a tragic hero, and I think he, he, there's an awful lot to like about him. And, and there was a great deal of racism in the criticism in the 19th and early 20th century, people writing about Othello, that you could see the writer's own racism coming through rather than the racism and any racism in the play. What about Macbeth? Oh, <laughs> what about Macbeth? <laughs> It's very anti-Scottish, I have to say. Yeah, 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 yeah it speaking is. Speaking of Scott, I'm I mean, obviously a, a comedy can, I uh, like a tragedy can work. Uh, well, I, mean, I, would, I would actually say that, I think the way Macbeth works, um, I think that for me, he goes through such guilt and he has this horrible, I mean, you know, he keeps almost coming to this moment of realizing how horrible these things are. And then that last scene where the witches really trap him in, and you go, oh. <laughs> but well, I he's like him. Othello, uh, in a way, because, I mean, he is, you, you can like him easily in the early scenes. And uh, he, um, he's like Othello because uh, if Othello hadn't had Iago, he would have been fine. And if Macbeth hadn't had Lady Macbeth, <laughs> and the witches, uh, I'm not saying that Lady, I'm not saying Lady Macbeth is like is, is exactly like Iago, but I do think it's correct to say that if she had not been his wife, uh, he probably would not have committed that. Murder. I, I one time I did a community. It was kind of fun. I did a, a reading club for some people, mostly were bankers and lawyers, and um, we did Shakespeare plays for a couple of years. And I, I love this one woman who, who who's um, husband was a head dame in corporate, a very wealthy corporate man, and she, she when she looked at Lady Macbeth, she says, I don't think she does anything that a lot of corporate wives wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and I, everybody sort of looked at me, yeah, that, that, yeah, I, you know, I, and I was, I, I'd like to add to that, I mean, with the question of Macbeth, and, and I think Iago, um, I think one of the things, and I'm, it's again, it's a different kind of paper, but one of the things Shakespeare really does do is confront the nature of evil. Um, and that, I mean, there is, aside from Lady Macbeth, there is evil in Macbeth with the witches and the supernatural. Um, there is evil, I, and I think, you know, I would just describe uh, uh, Iago as a sociopath. There's nothing that really motivates his action. Um, he gives little suggestions of why he does it, but nothing, nothing old. I mean, and so I think that that's one of the other things, just dealing with the problem of evil. I gotta sort of disagree. Well, I think primarily, and I disagree with Dan on the sec, that uh, I think he's a writer. A Shakespeare is a writer. And he has these characters that are set up to propel the action. So to say that an, a character, all of his characters serve a purpose. Now what their purpose is, is, you know, because I think in the end, I think, actually think um, a Merchant of Venice is in a lot of ways a problem play in that it has a MacGuffin. And the MacGuffin, if you know what a MacGuffin, it has to just kind of make sense, is the pack. Because it doesn't really make sense, that whole pack. You know, that he can get the- You're talking about the bond? Yeah, yeah, about the, about the pound of flesh. I mean, it's, it's there for us to say, oh, this makes sense, but it really never does. It doesn't make but sense. But it's, it's enough to, it, it makes enough sense that we can propel the action. Well, and not only that, um, there is a point where um, Shylock says, why would he want to take the bond? I, and, and, I, and I would take this, that's my case, I think, is why would he take the bond? There's no value in a pound of human flesh. Right. But, but I think he gets embittered. I think he doesn't start out, he changes right. in the course of the But point. isn't that the MacGuffin, the kind of thing that you just, I mean, does it make any sense? I mean, yeah, in I, the I, end, I, even at the yeah. end, what someone said about uh, the why, you know, uh, Portia. I mean, you would think Shylock would know enough to say, "Hey, this has got to be a mistrial at best." <laughs> <laughs> at yeah, best. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's just set up all to get. I mean, I think Shakespeare is a writer, and he's forming a story, and the story doesn't necessarily have to completely make sense, but as long as it it's possible, it can make sense. That's, yeah. you think that's right? Well, and I, I want to add to that. He's a dramatist, not a writer, in the right. sense of, because he stages these things. And 
that's one of the things that's really interesting is if you try and in your mind's eye see how these things look on a stage a lot I mean you get contrast that you don't really always get when you're reading um, you know if you're reading it as a piece of literature as opposed to envisioning dramatically he's able to really go a lot further in, in, in these possibilities yes with the idea of classical drama there's um, sort of severe evaluation the Roman commissioner of the Venetian is forced to accept that he is something that both sides are on you know it's sort of one doesn't believe he's going to win the spirit and the other believes that he, he needs to have the nursing home to be his so it's kind of hyper realized mm -hmm. um, but then as things ch fortunes change on both sides it could become a thing of the idea of an adaptant, yes. yes, I mean, it's sort of, it's there, but you're not supposed to take it that seriously, and then it becomes yeah. the essence of the play that on which everything turns, mm -hmm. and that's yet another stroke of Shakespeare's genius. And to get to your point about Shakespeare being a writer, absolutely, and in that sense, he reflects humanity across the board mm -hmm. throughout his play. Well, I, I think one of the things I've discovered in terms of the writer, and yeah, yes, yes, he's ob obviously a writer. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that's really interesting about drama as opposed to a novel, and, mm -hmm. and I found this teaching undergraduates, um, they have trouble reading drama initially because they keep wanting someone to come through with the explanation of what's going to happen next. <laughs> and the problem with drama is it doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it happens, but you don't get that narrative, at least on, in 16th and 17th century drama. Mm -hmm. Um, Tennessee Williams is different, but you know you don't you 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 have to see the confrontations between the characters and the interweaving, and we don't we we have to make our own judgments, um, and I think that's one of the other things that makes it complicated. Yes. Yeah, I mean I think it's difficult to say what you know Shakespeare has this viewpoint or ideology or that viewpoint. Yeah, I don't think so. Because because what's so exceptional is you know they they can be presented either way. I've seen Julius Caesar where. Brutus is really the noblest Roman of them all, and Caesar's a tyrant, but also Caesar is the bleeding piece of earth and a victim of treachery, you know. Uh, Edmund is, is a villain in King Lear, and yet when he says, why should I lose out just because I'm a year young, I mean, yeah. it resonates, you know. Even, even if it seems that this person is not the one with whom we should sympathize, he still gets to explain his position in a sympathetic way. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a more historical question? Dan always blames me for being a historian, so I, I, should, I, I should step into the role. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the balance here between the, the, the censorship and the sort of the popularity of theatre? Because I, I, I noticed that about 3,000 people could uh, attend a play, and that's 1.5% of the population of London. That's huge. It's a very, very, I mean, an enormously popular um, mm -hmm. medium of the time. And yet, uh, on the other hand, um, Elizabeth certainly is very concerned with censorship. Um, when uh, John Stubbs, an unfortunate man who criticizes her possible marriage with the Duke of Anjou, uh, in, in a, in a, he, he writes a, a pamphlet doing this, his publisher and him get their hands cut off. I mean, that's pretty serious. <laughs> and this this theme of censorship goes through to people like William Prynne, who gets half his ears cut off, then all his ears cut off, and then he gets branded. I mean, there is that really serious side of censorship. Oh, no, there, I, I would agree. I, and, and, I, and that's what I was saying. There, there are certainly, like, the treason laws, and actually the question of Stubbs um, came in under a sedition law because the pamphlet that he published uh, attacked, it wasn't attacking the queen for her choice of marriage, it was attacking the person she was going to marry. And it has this devastating, devastating condemnation of, of uh, Alençon. Um, so, so it becomes a piece of sedition. And sedition was obviously illegal. So it, yeah, I, I think the temptation is to just think that that pamphlet was a problem just because it criticized the queen, but it was, it was the other. And, and it was also probably Burley was involved in getting it printed so there were people in her government that were sort of turning their back. It, it's, it's a real nice, messy one. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to look into that. That's our awesome. curiosity. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a question on censorship. I just had a question on, in, in Othello, uh, um, 
Yahweh keeps on swearing by Janus, which is the the two faced God. You know, I, I just I just thought I love it was that. brilliant. I hadn't noticed that. That's really great. Yeah, and he's, he's got his own cosmology, I guess, is the else. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering how would they have known that? Would would the average person who's watching this make sense? Well, okay, so that that gets the complicated question. One of the most popular things was um, uh, if anyone was educated at all, they were educated in the classics. So yes, they would probably know, know that. Um, one of the, Ovid's, Ovid was one of the most popular writers and certainly he has metamorphosis talks about the gods. So yes, I, I think that most people would, would know that. And I like it, but I hadn't, that's funny, I hadn't thought about that. That's good, I like that. Do you know, or Rob or Claire, do you know, does that oath appear anywhere else in uh, the literature of this time? Because I, I mean, I've just been struck by that also. Janus face comes up. Yeah. Well, okay. Janus face. But as an oath, by, by Janus. But by Janus, you know, I just remember there's one in Othello. That's the only yeah. one I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the question too could be because we get the books, we get them further printed. Um, I've forgotten the exact year, but after after James came to the throne, there was a law passed uh, prohibiting the use of taking God's name in, on the stage, and so the way they got around it, it's like. King Lear, which is written after that, it is, there's no mention of a Christian god in that. That's not a, it looks like it's not a Christian play, but it could be, but it's all, it's all of these foreign gods in it, and that's just the way they got around. That was a, a censorship. And it, and it goes back to the start where we started with the folio, and looking at the Othello in the folio, and the different O's that are there from one of their uh, early, uh, early quarter. Mm. Well, there, there are all these things like zooms, which yeah. was God's wounds, and there are any number of those things. Uh, do they, do you think, we're, we're, in English, for example, we have words like darn and heck, which are, you know, they're very similar, right? I mean, from, from the time function, when yeah. people didn't want to say damn or hell. Um, and uh, so that's an ordinary discourse. Do you think these things were just in printed things because of censorship, or do you think they were actually part of uh, colloquial speech? Because I've always assumed the latter, but that might. Well, not something be right. like Zunes would be part of colloquial speech, yeah. but you, putting in the name of a of a Roman or Greek god. That's different. Yeah. That's different from from the. Hmm. Well, swear words are based on on religion then, as opposed to now they're based on sexuality or scatological references. Yeah. It's very, it's very it's a different world. Yeah. Yes, I would say very very different. Now, actually, I would say that's passe also. It's, it's based on things like race and things that can be associated there with There is that element. But although in Quebec, I think, they still keep religion. That's right. That's the swearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, this has really been great. Uh, We didn't have refreshments, so it's probably not too necessary. But just make sure there is a class coming in tomorrow morning, and there's not going to be any staff coming in to clean up between now and then. So please make sure that everything is clean and orderly around your place. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, those who uh, uh, are coming to the seminar on Saturday, we'll see you then. And if you'd like to come to the seminar on Saturday, uh, let me know. I guess yeah, I can take it now, or uh, you can send me an email. Uh, and uh, be back uh, on November 30th.